Hi, fourth grade, and welcome to your history lesson. We left off in chapter five talking about the New England colonies. We learned about Puritans and who they were. We are on page 50, and we are starting up here where it says freedom for some. There were many good things about the Puritan colony of Massachusetts, and there were many good people there. Some people, however, were unhappy because there was religious freedom in Massachusetts for the Puritans, but not for anyone else. That sounds strange because the Puritans had come to Massachusetts seeking religious freedom. They were so firm in their beliefs, however, that once they had control of the colony, they expected everyone to worship God exactly as they did. Once they got away from the King of England, they started to act like him. What the Puritans did was not unusual for their times. Almost every country in Europe had a state church, and very few people thought of separating religion and government. Because religion and government were ruled by the same people, the only people in Massachusetts who could vote were the Puritans. Puritans were the only people in the Massachusetts colony with religious and political freedom. Let's talk about problems for others. Christians in Massachusetts did not belong to a Puritan church. They could not start their own church. The Puritans leaders said, you must come to our church even if you don't belong to our church. You must pay money to our church and you must obey the laws made by our church. And you cannot vote unless you are a member of our church. The Puritans, the Puritans knew it was right to attend church, but they seemed to believe that by forcing people to go to their church, they could make everyone become Christians. Obadiah Holmes came to Massachusetts in 1638. Because he was a Baptist, he did not worship God exactly the way the other, can, the other Puritans did. He moved away from Massachusetts so he could have religious liberty. But one day he went back with his pastor and another man to visit a very old blind man who was also a Baptist. They had a church service in the man's house and preached, baptized, and held communion. The Puritan church leader did not like this, and they sent two policemen to arrest the three strangers. The three men were tried in Boston, and Obadiah Holmes was beaten with a whip for his preaching. This is, incident is just one sad thing that happened because of the lack of religious freedom in the Massachusetts colony. The Puritans were intelligent people. However, they, however, and they eventually learned that everyone ought to have religious freedom, for if everyone doesn't, then no one will for long. The Puritans of Massachusetts came to learn what the pilgrims already knew. When one man's freedom is taken away, everyone's freedom is threatened. The pilgrims were not the only people who saw this truth about religious freedom very early. A Puritan named Roger Williams, whom you may have already met as a missionary to the Indians, saw it too. Roger Williams and preachers like Obadiah Holmes have gone down in history as champions in the case of liberty for all. Up here at the top, you have a comprehension check 5A. This is to be done on a separate sheet of paper. Let's move on to Rhode Island and Roger Williams. He was a Puritan preacher in Massachusetts. He did much to bring about religious freedom in America. Because Williams believed in salvation by faith alone, he knew that no person could ever be forced to become a Christian. He told his neighbors that it was wrong to punish people for not believing exactly as they themselves believe, since punishment can never make a person believe on Jesus, on Jesus in his heart. Roger Williams' teachings upset some Massachusetts leaders. The leaders told Williams that they must either change his way or he must leave Massachusetts. William's ideas about the Native Americans also upset some people. He traded with them fairly and never tried to cheat them. After the trading was finished, he would tell them about God. At times, the Massachusetts settlers were unfair to the Indians. The settlers believed that since the Native Americans were not Christians, it would be all right to take away the Indians' land. Roger Williams asked the Puritan leaders, how do you expect the Indians to become Christians when you as Christians do not treat them fairly? The Indians should be paid for their land. The Puritan leaders became very angry. They ordered a ship to take Roger Williams back to England. Learning of their plans, William escaped into the wilderness. It was wintertime and he became really sick. 
Friendly Indians found him and took care of him until the spring. In the spring, he moved farther on. Williams bought land from the Indians, which he called Providence, for he believed God had directed him there. Freedom of Religion Soon, other people from the Massachusetts Bay Colony joined Williams, and three cities beside Providence were settled. More and more, settles, more, and more settlers wanted to become wanted to come to Roger Williams' colony, for it offered something very special, complete religious freedom. The people of Providence could worship as they chose. Let's go ahead and turn the page. Let's talk about Rhode Island becoming a colony. As the colony grew larger, Roger Williams decided that it should have a government and that it should become an official British colony. So the colony of Rhode Island came into being. Many people who had been persecuted for their beliefs helped Roger Williams set up Rhode Island. These people decided that Providence, the largest city in the colony, and the three other cities should band together and form one large government for the common good of Rhode Island. Years later, the 13 colonies would do very much the same thing when they banded together to form the United States of America. Let's talk about Rhode Island and how it gets a charter. Next. The people of Rhode Island needed to get a charter, which is a plan, for the colony to follow. When the king approved the charter, the colony had a legal right to exist. Rhode Island's charter was far different from other charters. Here is the most important part of Rhode Island's charter. No person within this said colony at any time hereafter shall be in any wise, uh, should be in any wise punished uh, disquieted or called into question for any differences in opinions in matters of religion and do not actually disturb the civil peace of our said colony. This charter was saying that Rhode Island's government could not bother a man whose religious beliefs were different from others. As long as that man did not disturb the peace, the charter then went on to say, all may at all times hereafter freely and fully have and enjoy their own judgments and consensus in matters of religion and concernment, not using this liberty to uh, use profanities nor to the civil injury on outward disturbances of others. In other words, Rhode Island could worship God however they chose. The government was not to get involved in religion. Church and state were separate. Of course, this did not mean that people could do whatever they chose to do. Those who did wrong things to others would be punished by the law. The people of Rhode Island believed strongly in religious freedom. They sent a minister, Dr. John Clark, to England to get the charter. Even though he had to stay in England for 12 years, he did not come home until he had the charter. With the chapter... Oh, I'm sorry, with the charter from England, they were assured that they were legally a colony and they had religious freedom. Now let's talk about freedom uh, for all. Because of Roger Williams and a small group of brave men, Rhode Island was the first colony to offer complete religious freedom. Because of its religious freedom, Rhode Island had a political freedom too. When Roger Williams began his colony, he could have forced everyone to do what he wanted. But he loved religion. He loved religious freedom and wanted everyone to be free to accept Christ by faith alone. He knew that God's truth. He knew that God's truth about spiritual matters can stand alone without being forced by a government. Roger Williams' title, Colony of Rhode Island, offered religious freedom and political freedom. The two important freedoms that all Americans would someday know. George Washington, our first president, said to Rhode Island. While the Baptists have always defended the principles of religious liberty, they have never violated them. They have had but one opportunity of forming a system of civil government, and they so formed it as to create an era in history of civilization. In the little Baptist state of Rhode Island was the experiment first attempted of leaving religion wholly to herself, unprotected and unsustained by the civil arm. The a uh, principle which were here first planted have taken root in other lands and have borne abundant fruit. Comprehension check uh, 5B. This is another comprehension check as well. New Hampshire. In 1623, an English ship 
named the jo- the I'm sorry, the Jonathan sailed near the coast of what is now New Hampshire. The fur the few men who were on board came to the New World because they were hired to fish and cut down trees for lumber. They did not consider themselves colonists, for a company had hired them to do this. The fish and lumber were to be taken back and sold in England. Since these men needed a place to live while they worked in the New World, they built a settlement. Small settlements such as this one, scattered here and there, gave new settlers a place to live. These settlements began to grow. A few years later, the land was given to John Mason, who was an early English explorer of New England. He named the land given to him in the New World New Hampshire, after Hampshire County, where he had lived in England. Meanwhile, some Puritans had settled in New Hampshire. In the early 1640s, the Puritans made New Hampshire a part of Massachusetts. However, the King of England later decided to make New Hampshire a separate colony once again. Connecticut. One day, some Native Americans appeared in Plymouth. They came to the colony to invite the white men to come and live on their land. Our land is rich, the Indians said. Beaver live in our woods. Our woods are thick with trees. The white man could trap furs and cut lumber for a living. The Indians went on to say why they wanted the white man to come. A fierce tribe lives on each side of our tribe. We are peaceful. Our enemies are afraid of the white man's gun. If you come, we will all live in peace. In 1630, one man from Plymouth went into the area and built a trading post on a river. A trading post is where you can trade with the Indians. He reported that the Indians were telling the truth. The area was a good place to live. Soon, other settlers were flocking to the area. The white men called the area Connecticut, their version of an Indian word, meaning on or beside the long tidal river. The most famous settler was Thomas Hooker, a Puritan preacher from Massachusetts Bay Colony. He um, and about 100 of his church members built Hartford, the first major settlement in Connecticut. Hartford had several smaller towns joined together to form the colony of Connecticut. In 1638, Thomas Hooker preached an important sermon. In the sermon, Hooker stated that the people should control the government rather than the government ruling the people. He said that people should have the right to elect the officials who run the government, kind of like how we elect the president. In 1639, Connecticut put these ideas into the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, the document that established Connecticut's system of government. Later, the Fundamental Orders would provide a good pattern for the Constitution of the United States. All right, that concludes our history lesson. Thank you, guys.